It's now time for On the Line with Cheryl Wilkerson. The conversation will range from local dialogue to international. This show is meant to enlighten, inform, and to inspire. On the Line with Cheryl Wilkerson begins now. Hello and welcome to a new year. I'm Cheryl Wilkerson. This, of course, is On the Line. Excited about 2023. Hope you are as well. I want to say thank you all for joining me as you do every Sunday at 11 o'clock. I realize you don't have to do it. So I appreciate you joining me as you do. Excited about my first guest for the new year. Imagine that you're a young man, you're playing middle school football, you're a star of football team, you're in gifted and talented classes, you kick cancer in the butt, you're just out here living your best life until one day, until one day when somebody accuses you of something that you did not do and you are sent away for 60 years. That's exactly what happened to my guest today. Utica Briley is my guest. Hello and welcome to On the Line. How are you? I'm fine, Cheryl. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you for being with us today. As I painted that picture, I'm sure that people did not think at all that I was going to say in the end that you were sentenced to 60 years in prison for something that you didn't do. Can you back us up and tell us how this all began? Um, You're in New well, Orleans. All right. Um, well, I'm going to just go back to that day. Okay. Well, um, my, um, I'm going I'm to I'm just be honest. You know, a lot of time, you know, I was 19 years old and, um, you know, basically I was selling drugs. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, my dad and I had, um, I, I actually didn't have me a car because I had I had ran the motor out of my car, so my dad was driving me off because you know I didn't in the area where I stayed at where I lay my hair I really didn't do no like you know no dirt at okay so my father actually dropped me off in the area of New Orleans in Mid City which is like you know between like third one and seventeenth my daddy dropped me off over there so I can go hustle. So, um, now let me interrupt you so you can explain this to us. So we understand, tell me why you all were doing that. What, what made you make that decision that that was the route for you to go to hustle? I mean, back then, Mm -hmm. you know, I always tell like, you know, younger people right now, you know, back, you know, I'm, you know, born 93. So, well, you know, I I was grew up, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, but you know, back then, you know, just coming up in poverty and coming up around certain stuff. One of all, you know, you become a product of your environment. You know, I'm a 90s baby. The well, you know, we're a direct effect of like the crack era. So, uh, all uh, my friends' parents, my parents, you know, they was on crack cocaine. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it was real prevalent in our community. And also, you know, to make it out the hood, to make it, you know, to be successful in our community. Mm-hmm. Like the only way we saw it was to play sports, sell drugs. Uh, like, you know, those were the only positive and successful people that we saw directly, you know, back then we have internet, uh, you know, that internet era kind of came a little later. So just like, you know, growing up, you know, we, I was kind of influenced by a lot of the wrong stuff just cause, you know, it was in my face. But but and, you you were a pretty good football player, so you didn't want to go that route. I mean, how you, I, I mean, how you gonna play football and you post like you know you, okay. know, you know um I mean once I got to like high school you know it, 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 I don't even have time to go to practice like I don't have time to go to practice like when I get home from school like I gotta go like hustle try to give me something to eat I gotta hustle for the summer try to give me some clothes to wear to school. Like, you know, so you weren't doing ways. this so you could go out and buy a Maserati. You were doing this. So like you said, you would have food to eat and you would have clothes to put on your body. That's why you were doing it. My, my mom, my mom, back then, my mom had five kids. I was the oldest. Mm-hmm. So, you know, back then, you know, we're in the house with my grandma. You know, it was probably like eight, nine of us in a two bedroom. So, you know, and I want to say a lot of times my mom wasn't working for one reason or another, but for okay. my grandfather died, so he probably was the only person in the house with a source of income, mm-hmm. and that was barely enough to pay the bills. So, uh, you know, often, more often than not, you know, one of the bills, you know, lights off, you know, the um, 
trust, you know, water might go off this month. You know, mm -hmm. it was survival. If, if I'm hearing you correctly, it was survival. Am I right? Yes, ma'am. OK, so take me to that day. What's going on? You said your father had dropped you off. Yeah. All right. Now I'm 19 years old. I'm staying back in New Orleans. Now. And, you know, like I, you know, once I did come back to New Orleans, like, you know, all my behaviors, my activities went to complete to the wrong direction. So right now I'm 19. Like, you know, I'm hustling. So my dad dropped me off. And like in mid city to go, you know, do my little thing, and I'm walking with my partner, with two of my friends. Well, I ain't gonna say my friends, but I'm gonna say yeah, it was about three of us walking to the store, and it just so happened like all three of these dudes are dead right now. So it's like just a crazy story. But um, we were walking to the store, mm -hmm. and a police officer pulled up, and you know he went to flash the light. On everybody, he was like, you know, I know everybody except you. Was like, who you is? So he asked me. So, you know, I broke out running once he told me to come here. And, um, you know, him and a few other officers, they, they chased me, they called me or whatever. Um, I didn't get a chance to throw the gun I had on me. So he called me with a gun. Okay. So, um, you know, now I'm, you know, I'm getting arrested. I'm thinking I'm facing, you know, a weapon charge, you know, convicted felon with a firearm. You know what I mean? I done been in jail before. You know, so I'm really thinking, like, you know, got to sit a few months my parole or whatever, I'm buying out and be straight. You know, I ain't really, you know, really thinking nothing of it. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right, um, and, yeah. And, and you know what? You said you weren't really thinking anything of it. And me, I'm I'm a wimp. <laughs> you call I'm a wimp. Mm -hmm. So I would have been terrified. I would have been shaking in my boots at this time. But you just looked at it like, oh, okay, I got caught with a weapon, so... I'm on parole, so I'll just go do a little time and I'll be back out. Is that right? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Okay. And I'll look at this for because, you know, like, you know, you're looking at jail like it's a part of the lifestyle. And then I had really, you know, like I had already been a few times, like I'm telling you, you know, and that's another terrible thing that used to, you know, goes on in our community where, you know, we raised up and, you got people telling jail stories like it's a badge to honor or something. Uh, they telling jail stories like, you know, this is an expected part of life, like, you know. So, so you know, like, you know, back then it really wasn't nothing. Like, you know, probably a lot to go to jail for, you know, a few months or whatever. Got to sit. You know, it really wasn't, you know. When when did you realize uh, that it really wasn't going to be just a few months? Oh, when um I was in Central Booking. Mm -hmm. And, you um. I know, and I, I know, and um, in New Orleans, they um, your wristband is gonna be reflecting on like what type of charge you on. Okay. So once they put they put a red wristband on my wrist, and a red wristband usually mean like a violent charge. That was yeah, a, a red a red I mean like you know a crime of violence. And so, so then you knew. Yeah, when I was getting booked, and she put the you know we we call him a Rolex. She put the Rolex on my wrist. I'm like, um, you know, I'm on a, I'm on a gun charge, man. I'm like, you know, I'm supposed, I'm not violent. Like, I ain't supposed to have this color. And she like, well, um, you know, yeah, you are on a, on a, on a, on a gun charge, but you're also on a robbery charge. What the fire you on? And you're like, I'm what like, robbery charge? Exactly. I'm like, what you mean? Like, I'm like, robbery on who? She like, you know, I should be asking you that. Like, you know, she being smart, like, you know, she, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, right then and there, I wasn't even about to use the phone or nothing. And to this point, I ain't had used the phone. I ain't had dead nothing. Mm -hmm. But once they told me um, I was getting booked on a robbery, I wanted to go in and use the phone to try to find out what's going on now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the same thing. Like, you know, I'm calling. Or right, you know, right the time I called my best friend, he like, well, you know, what's going on? You know, and it's the same thing. He, You know, so we was at a dead end. Cause we both know he asked me what's going on. I'm telling him, you know, I really, I had to go to court to start getting, like, my discovery packet and starting to find out what's going. That's how I found out about the charge, like, actually going to court. So I was at, like, all kinds of disadvantages even fighting the charge, like, because by me really didn't do it. I didn't know anything about it. Like, <laughs> mm. So there was a man that said, accused you and the people with you of, Stealing a hundred and two dollars from him is that the robbery charge you were talking about? Well, that's how it went. And um, the dude. 
Right. He was staying in the area, probably about six blocks from where I was arrested at. And um, he pulled up to his house, and two dudes came from behind the car and robbed him at gunpoint. They robbed him out of his phone and like $100. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was how the... All right, so he reported it to the police or whatever. But the police, really, they knew I didn't commit the crime because, you know, I was walking with three, four other people. None of them was even detained, even questioned. You know, I was never even questioned, interrogated, or no all robbery. Like, mm-hmm. They asked me questions about everything but robberies. Like, they asked me all kind of stuff. But, you know, the police, they, they knew I didn't do it. Because, you know, if, if they was doing, like, you know, an honest investigation, mm-hmm. then, you know, the, the people I was walking down the street would probably would have been detained, questioned, you know. Because if y'all look, and then, you know, when they wrote the report, they're looking at the report like, they wrote the report like they stopped me because I was a suspect. Right. That's, you know, and for, you know, for the listeners or whoever, you know, it ain't, you don't have to do too much research to see the corruption in the New Orleans Police Department to, uh, you know, corruption and just, you know, lying and, you know, just fake police reports, you know, how they do it on TV and all that. Like, it's really common down here to where uh, that's a practice that's actually prevalent to what even the police just putting anything together, lying on you or whatever. I'm talking about to the point that was when I was doing my appeal, my lawyer was trying to find the police officers. All the police officers had got fired almost. You know, I had probably out of five police officers involved in my case, four of them was fired because of misconduct, but because it is. So, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was crazy, Cheryl. It was crazy. And so not only were you having to fight the police, because when you realize what was going on, if I have the story straight, you realize there should be tape of you that would prove that you were innocent. And so you asked for the tape. Did you ever get the videotape? Yes, ma'am. You did get the um, tape. No, um, I just went, all right. When I caught this charge, mm-hmm. I was already out on bond for another weapon charge, for a gun charge. So my lawyer that was representing me on the first charge, mm-hmm. I automatically hired him at first for my charge that this charge they put on me. But, all right, I was having trouble paying them, and I had still owed him some money. Mm-hmm. So he actually, he filed for the wrong time because he wasn't really even paying attention to my case. That was, you know, that's another thing. We know that the, the criminal justice system down here is a business. Everywhere, well, like you know, everywhere. Yes, I mean, I mean, for show, show down here though, like you know, down here in Louisiana, you gotta think like this, this, this number one, this number one industry. This is it's one of the top industries in the state. You know, Prince Enterprise and all that top industry in the state. So, you know, just like it is, it, it, especially like you know, when you know you go in the courtroom, like. You know, like I say, it ain't it ain't even about justice. It ain't about right or wrong no more. It's like, you know, you, you step into somebody's business, to, to somebody's office. It's about the money. But, and and so, that, he, so didn't, I, he didn't really... I, I, not, I, I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm sorry to cut you off. What you saying, Cheryl? I was going to say, so he really didn't take care of you because he, you you still owed him money, and so you weren't a priority for him. Exactly. So he filed for the wrong time for the footage at the hotel that would have exonerated me early that would have dropped the case early but you know like you say i'm i'm so bottom i'm so bottom of a priority because i wasn't i wasn't paid i wasn't paid all the way you know i ain't pay him all the way hmm. i ain't have nobody out here who was gonna handle my business really because um you know everything i went to trial in like four four months like four and a half months so you know this everything was bad so i needed the stuff to be done like really quick mm-hmm. so um how, how long? Yeah, did you, um, he, how how long did you actually sit in jail? What do you mean? How long did I sit? Well, all together. Yes. All together, I did about eight and a half years, almost nine years. Eight and a half, almost nine years. When there was evidence out there that would have cleared you immediately of the robbery, I understand what you're saying about the gun charge, and I, I get all of that. But as far as that robbery, you could have been exonerated from that immediately. Exactly. I mean, but, you know, technically for the gun, I could have got, you know, well, from probation to, you know, probably about two, three years, top 18 months. You know, that wouldn't have really been, you know, no long stretch like that. Mm-hmm. And what finally 
happened in your favor? Because in those eight and a half years, I know you were trying and trying and trying to get out of there and the prosecutor not helping, not turning over tapes, not turning in other material, a lawyer that's not helping you because you're not paying them because you don't have the money. What eventually happened in your favor when things started coming the way you needed them to come? What happened? I mean, it ain't really, it wasn't really no event like that where it just, I mean, I, I, I got convicted. I'm sentenced to 65 years. I sat in jail. I sat in prison seven years before I even met anybody that was going to try. You know, it really was kind of simple. You know, I really just didn't have nobody out here to, you know, try to do this. You know, once, once I actually met Emily and Laura, once they signed on my case, mm-hmm. I pretty much told them I had everything I already instructed on, you know, what to do and the, the, the main things that have helped get me out. And ex- but, explain to know. the audience who those ladies are. All right. Um, I was actually, I was on lockdown and I was listening to the radio. And um, that was when I heard Miss Emily Bazelon. She had released a book named Charged. So um, I, I got my people to Google her address. This is just something that I used to do. I used to just, you know, because basically, you know, I'm stuck in prison or basically a life sentence. I used to just write random people. Not random people, but people that I think that are trying to help me. Mm-hmm. You know, because, you know, it's like, you know, at the time I'm, I'm feeling like, you know, I'm just in jail for the charge I didn't do it. It's just so easy to get me out. Like, it really wasn't difficult. So I used to just write all kind of people, like newspaper, anything I can read in the newspaper, you know. That's smart. Um, programs, anybody that are, you know, in the criminal justice, wrongful convictions, innocent project, wrote all those type people. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I was listening to the radio early in the morning, and Miss Emily had. Ms. Baslon, Emily Baslon had released her book, Charged. So I basically listened to her talk about a book, and I wrote her a letter, you know, telling her, like, you know, I'm just like the character in your book, except, you know, the charge that he's he got convicted, I'm innocent. Like, you, she was writing about a dude that got convicted on the charge that he did, you know, I'm just like him, except I'm innocent. Now, I had um actually like a pen pal from Oregon. Now, me and, this, me and her actually ended up developing like more of a mother son relationship. Mm-hmm. So some of the people I used to contact to try to help me, she would contact them too from the outside and like, you know, try to, you know, just let them know what's, what's going on. So she contacted Emily and basically let her know that I had wrote a letter at Yale University. So Emily dug in her mail. She would have never seen the letter. She dug in her mail for like three, four months ago and found a letter. She said when she read it, something just jumped out there and, like, you know, she just felt it like, you know, I was different. And went home with the communicating from there, me and Emily Bazemar. And also, to add to the story, new uh, district attorneys were put in office or new prosecutors were put in office. And this was after your family had hired two private attorneys, right? No, my family hired no attorney. Um, you talking about when I was fighting in charge? Yeah, did anybody hire any private oh, yeah, attorneys? Yeah. I for, mean, I had, I had, I, I hired my own attorney once. Once I went to jail, once when I first caught the charge, but right before I went to trial, mm-hmm. one of my friends had got me a lawyer. But the day I went to trial, that was my first day in court with him. Oh, so, I you know it was all kind of stuff. But right, like I say, it was really, it was really clear as day that I wasn't the person that committed the crime. Like. It was like the you know the state they did they did everything they could like match me up to the crime, mm-hmm. and so which you, just you know it, you know further shines a light on how corrupt it was down here. And it took new people coming into office. Like I said, I don't know if you call it a district attorney there in Louisiana, but yeah, new the, people. The DA, they, they had got a new DA mm-hmm. and a new judge, so basically they stopped fighting because the stuff that exonerated was there the whole time. It just the DA. And the judge, they was fighting, like, you know, when Laura signed on my case, so I forgot, all right, Miss Emily, you know, you know, she she wasn't really she wasn't practicing law. So she got her sister to sign on my case. Her sister was over the law school at the University of San Francisco. So her and and the law students started working on my case. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, once Laura signed on my case, you know, I had like four, five hundred pages of missing transcripts. Now she had to wait about a year to get the, the transcript. 
And then once they gave it to the the district attorney at the time, he had redacted them, had all kind of stuff blacked out. It was like, you know, they was fighting me for everything out of free me. They fighting for everything that'll free me, and once they did give it to me, they blacked it out, so it wasn't even visible. <laughs> mm-hmm. So at that point, and I guess what, you were feeling pretty hopeless, even though, well, maybe you were feeling hopeful because you did have Miss Emily and these ladies helping you. So were you? Did you have hope at that point, or no? Yeah, I really felt like I ain't had nothing to lose. I really, you know, I had been faced the fact that there was a possibility I might die in prison. Like I had, I, I, I didn't, I had accepted that fact already. Like I accepted that as a possibility. Like, it is a possibility that I'm going to die in prison. Like, you that know, is so. deep. And, and may well, I ask you, what what is your family doing this whole time that you're in prison? What is happening with the family as far as you know? I mean, they doing what they what they do. They surviving how they survive. My daddy just rubbed it in my face that I should have pled guilty. I told you so. And, like, you know, that just was his thing. Like, he, I, I don't know, you know, I don't want to say this on no show, but it was like, you know, my father, like, he like he was happy to see me that, like, you know, just, you know, yeah, I told you so. And, you know, if you would have just been like me instead of being like your mama, I don't know. Okay, so I got you. It was like he was making no effort to try to get me out of there. That's what I'm saying. Like, you know, once Miss Emily and Laura did sign on my case and they saw how easy, you know, and how it was to get me out, like, that really made them, like, you know, they, they made them kind of understand, you know, why I know I've been, you know, really associated with my family no more. I am speaking to Utica Briley. He was sentenced to 60 years in prison for a crime that he did not do. Can you now, we're almost at the end of 30 minutes, and I do not want you to get off this call before you explain or describe the day that you knew that you were going to get out. Oh, uh, I didn't know I was going to get out until... Like a day before, cause once like I gotta say once um we started getting all the evidence and a new judge and a new DA came in, they stopped fighting. It was more of a contacting the victim thing. Now that's another thing I didn't explain to you about the victim. My investigator found out that the victim was actually a drug dealer when he got robbed. Oh, he was actually a drug dealer the time he got robbed. Oh. But we gonna we gonna fast forward eight nine years now. Nine. He way overseas in France somewhere. I'm gonna say yeah. His his, his, his wife was like a teacher at a prestigious school overseas, so it was like they was having trouble contacting him to let him know that you know I was getting out. You know, so that was like a hold up thing. Mm. But so it was like they was telling me like I might sit in jail like a few more months, and then they end up calling my lawyer end up calling me saying, well look, they could just gonna make something. Well look. You don't contact the victim. We're going to agree to that. And that's just going to make it to where they can let you out early without, without you know, letting them know. Okay. Okay. So, so I'm sure you agreed really to that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was after after fighting, you know, me and, me, Laura, me and Laura and my students and stuff, my team, we have been fighting about two years already. So it was like, you know, it was uncertain for about for two years. Utica, what was the first thing you did when you got out of prison? Um, I gave my mama a hug. You know, the New York Times people was there with the cameras and stuff, and, you know, I know they wanted to make it look good and stuff. So, my, you know, my mama, she came, popped up, you know, played a you know, supportive mom role, make it look good for the newspaper. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I gave her a hug, gave my students a good hug, you know, gave my lawyer a hug, we sat up. You know, it's just, you know, breathing the fresh air. They took some pictures, you know, I was in the front of the New York Times. So, you know, they took their pictures and all this in the front of the gate. Mm-hmm. You know, we went to a gas station. I bought. I went to a gas station, bought it to a correctional officer. It was crazy. It was so crazy. <laughs> and, and, and before, again, before we run out of time, you have lasting effects from being in jail, in prison? What do you mean lasting effects? Like what? Am I still putting up with no, like, stuff like like when you put your head on the pillow at night, do you just go to sleep? Oh, I mean, every you... day. I mean, every day, you know, I'm still, you know, I'm trying to repair a broken relationship still from, you know, just being a ghost for disappearing for almost a decade. You know, I still deal with, you know, all kind of stuff. Sometimes I sit in my apartment sometimes and I go to feeling like I'm in a jail cell. So I got to move around. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, you know, just every day I'm still dealing with it. Just all kind of stuff. Like, you know, I have sleeping problems. Like, you know, probably almost like insomnia almost. 
you know, sometimes they have nightmares, it's, you know, but, you know, I, I'm not complaining about it. I, you know, I, I don't want to complain about it, make it seem like I'm not appreciative of where I'm at now, but, right. and, you and know. What are you going to do just, for the next 50 years? For the next 50 years? Yeah, what you going to do for the next 50 years? Oh, I'm going I'm to I'm 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 appreciate life, I'm going to live life, I'm going to appreciate life, and I'm going to, um, every day I'm awake, I'm going to be a better person than I was the day before. I'm going to enjoy it, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to just, you know. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. That's wonderful. I know that, like you said, you've been featured in the New York Times, and I know that colleges and, and corporations call you to be featured speaker, and I think all of that is wonderful. It sounds like you have your head on straight. I cannot imagine what you have gone through, but you have gone through it, and you have come out on the other side and I just wanted people to hear your story because, you know, sometimes people think, oh, you know, well, they shouldn't do this or they shouldn't do that. And like you said, they don't even have any idea about the corruption that's going on, you know. So I'm really thankful that you agreed to come on this show today. I'm thankful that you gave me the pleasure and the opportunity to be on your show, Ms. Cheryl. Um, you know, it was, it was actually a relief to, you know, even have someone to talk to today. Uh, so you have a motto. Am I right about that? You have a favorite motto or a favorite saying? I got a few of those. Which uh, one? Which, you you, you cling on the one? You like one okay, of them? Okay, we got about three minutes, so give me give me a couple of them. I mean, what? What? Some what? My favorite saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's your favorite saying? <laughs> um, I, don't, I, don't, um, I know I always tell myself just like life is 90% mental, 10% physical. Ooh, yes. Yes, that's one thing I always tell myself. Like you know, the the, the war is in the mind. The battle, the battle is in the mind. The battle is in the mind. And do you so have you a famous saying about a cup? Oh, the cup is always half. The cup is always half full. The cup is the always cup. half full. Why? Why does that? Why does that stick with you? Because life is what you make it, and you know, and the the like you know, you know, you see from my situation. What if I would have just gave up hope? At five years and just, you know. Yeah, suppose like, you didn't you know, write those letters or listen to the radio or yeah, just reach out to people. No, I'm with like, you. Yeah, it's always up with me. It's always I'm always optimistic with it. Like, it's always a chance. It's always hope. It's always something good going on. It's always something to smile for with me. Like, you know, even at the worst times, like. So, you know, that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's just my outlook. Um, Cheryl, that's my outlook. You know, I'm always try to cheer everybody up and I'm always bring out the positive. I'm always tell somebody, look at the good thing. Even, you know, that's why everybody liked me back, you know, when I was in that place. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, I used to always, you know, I'm gonna make them make, I'm gonna find something to be happy about a smile about. Yeah. I'm sure people did appreciate you because you, in fact, were bringing the sunshine in a very dreary place. And so, yeah, yeah I'm sure they were giving you a lot of love for that. I am proud of you, young man. I am proud of you. Uh, thank I just, you, thank you, man. Yep, I am proud of you. I want you to uh, know that, you know what, it's people out here that care about you. There are people out here that look at you in amazement because what you have done, a lot of people didn't have the stamp, stamina to do. Some people would have just given up. Like you said, you didn't do that. So, Utica Briley, you keep on keeping on and being great. You are welcome on these airways anytime. All right, Ms. Cheryl, thank you. Thank you so much. And we want to thank you, the listening audience, for checking out this story today. It is it's just remarkable what people go through. And we sometimes we just sit back and we judge people and we don't have a clue as to what is really going on. So this year we want to open our eyes and we want to be intentional and we want to help our brothers and sisters whenever we can. I'm Cheryl Wilkerson. Thank you so much for listening to On the Line today. We will do it again next Sunday. You all take care, stay safe, and behold the green and gold. Oh, and before I go, how about those Spartans at that Rose Parade the other day? But anyway, yes, got to get out of here. Cheryl Wilkerson on the line. Take care. Behold the green and gold.